Cube Tuesdays. I'm Jason Barnard from Cali Cube, and I'm with Craig Rodney, the agency coach. Welcome, Craig. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. A quick hello, and we're good to go. Welcome to the show, Craig Rodney. I don't think I've ever had my name sung before, so I appreciate that. Oh, lovely. It's and you got birthday. <laughs> Obviously. Is it your birthday? No, I'm saying happy birthday. They always sing your name outside of. Oh, right. That's a good birthday. point. Yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. But yeah, I can sing a happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Greg Rodney. Happy you know, birthday you know, to you. Know you. The joke. you know the joke where they say, like, no matter what your name is, I can sing a song for you. And that's the, you just go happy birthday. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I can sing another song, which is a quick hello and we're good to go. Welcome to the show, Craig Rodney. Thank you. Brilliant. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is now Branded Search and Beyond with Jason Barnard. And we're going to talk about how to escape survival mode in your agency. And it's hugely interesting. It comes exactly the right time for me because I was talking last week at Birmingham SEO about agencies, how to scale, how to run, how not to get bogged down in the mud. And we're going to be talking about that today. So I'll get some more advice from you, Craig, that's going to take me on from what I learned last week. But before we talk about escaping survival mode in your agency, let's have a look at your brand set. Here we go. Craig Rodney, you've got two little rich site links there. I searched in Cape Town to see what came up. That looks pretty good. Um, your own website at the top, the agency coach. Yep. Um, did you make any particular effort with that page or that site, sorry? Um, the, the, yeah, I, the, the, the site was a very specific build from my side. Um, I wanted it to come up first. I wanted it to be predominantly about my coaching, not anything else. Um, mm -hmm. because I guess if, if people are searching for me, this is what I want them to be finding. Right. And people search for you a lot because you put your name out there. Yeah. Uh, as, as much as possible uh, is to be kind of present in as many areas and as many facets online as I can be. Um, and th I'm quite lucky. Like I've got a fairly simple name. Two first names is a lot easier to right. remember, and and it's a, it's it's quite an uncommon name. And so I, I, I'm not really competing uh, on, on on search engines right. for my, name, which is really handy. Yeah, I mean, when I saw your name, I thought, oh, there must be a lot of competition. But you're right; it's two first names, so there isn't. Yeah, and so I have I have at Craig Rodney on every social platform, like. It's, it's, you know, so it, it, again, it makes life easier. It makes that consistency, whether it's LinkedIn, right. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everything. It's just my name and first name um, and the, and the dot com. Right. Oh, yeah. The dot com is important. We talked to Tatiana about that right at the beginning of the year. But the other thing that surprises me is people push themselves out there, all the social media, blog posting, guest posting, podcasts. And then they don't think about what appears when the person they've reached out to through all of this presence searches their brand name and you have or their personal name rather um, and if anybody's interested in that join the Cali Cube knowledge panel and brand SERP support group on Facebook or just search knowledge panel and brand SERP support group we've got the only one in the world so you'll only find us and then I found this you have a knowledge panel did you know that I did not know that no well, there you go well you've got your KGM ID written on screen there uh, you've got a a lovely tiny knowledge panel it's recognized your linkedin your instagram it's got your website that will soon be your entity home as long as you're consistent that knowledge panel will grow you don't need to do anything in particular because you're so consistent and organized and you make the effort lovely i love that that's good to know i was i was a bit nervous um but, but, <laughs> but I, 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 I was like there's not there's not much you can do in in a week prior to coming on this call and so I was like, it'll, it'll be what it'll be. It's, it's, um, I, but I, 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 I can tell you the, the handiness of having that consistency across all my pages, I think, I think is a big deal. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's, uh, in, in, in your world, I know it's a critical point it, for me. It's, it makes my life easier. Cause I just go, I'm at Craig Rodney. Um, yeah. and pretty much whatever, whatever platform you go in, if I'm there, that will be my username. Right. I just don't. I don't have the Gmail, which is weird. I'm like, who, who out there got the Gmail? Like that's very right. Weird. Anyway, I don't need. Thankfully, I don't. I don't need the Craig Rodney at Gmail address, so I'll be okay. 
No, brilliant. But it's really smart. People underestimate it. And you say it's critical in my industry, but actually nobody pays attention to it except me. They're only just starting. Um, but I agree with you 100%. Getting all of those handles right, getting the website right, making sure that when people Google your name, they see what you want them to see, which in your case is the agency coach, which is a delightful yeah. segue that I just managed to do. The agency brilliant. coach is going to talk about how to escape survival mode in your agency. Now, what is survival mode is the first question. It's where you feel stuck doing the same thing every day. You never have enough money. You never have enough time, but you're always busy with clients and you're always chasing for payments. You're always hunting new clients. You're always under the thumb of clients wanting more, pushing for more. You are struggling to get the best out of your teams because you can't afford brilliant people because you don't have money and and you feel like you're perpetually circling the drain and the only thing keeping you from going down the drain is the frantic kicking, which is exhausting. Um, right. And, and most, most agencies know this, that, that, that everyone has some experience of this. Right. Okay. Well, absolutely brilliant. You described Cali Cube of a year ago and you've described yeah. Cali Cube now, except for one thing is the team. I have an amazing team and yeah. I don't feel that they're not up to a scratch. They're doing amazing work. So I've got all the rest of it doing the same thing, chasing clients, trying to keep clients happy, uh, and, and generally feeling that it's always a struggle just to keep going. And what's the solution? Um, you need to get lazier. Is oh, the thing how that, lovely. That's, it surprises most people. Um, most agency owners that I start coaching with work too hard. Um, mm. They commit way too many hours to the to the business, and and there's there's a few reasons for that. But the solution ultimately is to become a become lazy. Um, but my phrase that I always tell everyone is: you need to be high functioning lazy, right? Mm. It's don't, don't be low functioning lazy. Low functioning lazy is is sitting on the couch, um, you know, watching the watching a five day cricket match or something like that. Like that's that's you, that's low functioning. You want to be high functioning lazy. Um, which basically means is you become hyper precious about your time. So you need to Ooh. increase your perceived value of your time and you need to decrease your, the perceived value of money. Now I'll and, tell you something about that is that we've already had a chat and yes. you've talked to Christina who is running the elite agency group at Cali Cube Pro and she's taken that idea really to heart and she's trying to move me to the top of the pyramid and make my time more precious less accessible and charge more for it so she's doing the right thing absolutely absolutely the right thing the 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 weird thing about uh survival mode for agencies is so so very few agencies that i've ever engaged with started with startup capital most of them start their capital is time right so right. you go i'm going to start Brilliant. this business I've got this, I've got this niche, I've got this thing I want to go and do. And your capital contribution to the business is 100% of your time. Right. Um, but you don't have money. Um, and so you start in a world where you have a scarcity of money and an abundance of time. And so time feels like this resource that you use to pay for things. So you throw time at every problem. So you go, oh, I can't afford a bookkeeper. I'll do it. I can't yeah. afford client service people. I'll do it. Okay, right. And yeah. so your time becomes the primary currency because you have an abundance of it. But because you have an abundance of it, you tend to devalue it. I mean, this is, you know, yeah. basic economics. And, and so you tend, so, and because you don't have money, you're willing to give a lot of time to just get any kind of money into the business. What I will say, and I don't want to be critical of survival mode because if you're in survival mode, the decisions that you make to survive are the correct ones. Hmm. I, any decision that you have to make that sees you make it to next month, it's the right one. I'm going to back you there, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's better than going out of business. But what you have to know is that the decisions that you make to survive trap you in survival mode. Hmm. The, the, it, 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 in, in order to survive, you're going to discount your next quote because you have to get it in. 
Yes. Well, you've discounted that quote, which means you've devalued your time, which means you're going to have to you're going to have to give more time for less money, and now you're stuck in survival mode, right? And and so on and so forth. So so these the decision frameworks that you use to navigate survival mode tend to trap you there, right. uh, which means sorry, yeah. No, sorry. I will we'll come. We'll, we'll continue that part. Yeah. I was just coming back to the undercharging is a huge mistake, but it's very, very difficult to have the courage to say it's this much money, like for twenty four thousand dollars, and not a flinch and b wait for the person to then come back and say, okay, you're immediately saying, but I'll give you a discount because you're so desperate yeah. to sign. And I was talking to a friend of mine, Mariana, about this, and she's trying to move towards less survival mode. And that's her big struggle, and it's always been my big struggle. How do you overcome that was the question. That wasn't a question until I got to the end there. Yeah. The, 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 it's not the courage to quote correctly. It's the courage to let them walk. And I want, I want to make a slight distinction, right? Because actually sending a quote for a high amount, it, it, the fear is not sending a quote with a high number on it. The fear is that they say no, and you don't right. get a second bite at that apple, right? And and that fear is going well. If we don't have this client, how are we going to survive? Yes. And and that's as I said. So the, and when I say it's a trap, it's a bear trap. Like this thing is not. You know, it, it's it's survival mode has it's the suction to it. Like you know, mm -hmm. you can pull it and and you put in tons of effort. And I I I, I get this a lot with a lot of agencies go that they go. We want to scale. This is not my first time we've tried to scale. You know, they'll get up 10, 15, 20 people straight back into straight back. And so because survival mode doesn't want to let you go. It, it, right. it's, 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 it's difficult. So, oh, but I'm that, sorry. That, I, I like the idea that survival mode is this kind of massive squid in the sea that just keeps yeah. pulling you in and pulling you Actually, in. It's, and it, it desperately it wants to it. keep hold. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it, 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 it's important to, to see it as a thing. Right, mm. it, it, um, it, see it as a separate thing. It's something that you that you can confront, you can systematically dismantle. Right, right. It, it, and it is and it is your behaviors. It's the way that you approach these things. But it, but survival mode doesn't. It really doesn't want to let you go. Which and, is a huge a huge insight. But then you say you can dismantle it, and that's the decision process. You need to change or your decision frameworks. I think you say. Yes. Yeah. So your what does that mean? <laughs> It means so there's a few key ones. The first one is you have to value your time more than money. So going back to the sing off, you need to be high functioning lazy, mm -hmm. right? You need to stop doing everything and you need to start throwing money at problems. Right? right. Because if I like if if I said to you or if I said to any agency owner, which I do when I work with agency owners, and I say, if the only thing that you had to do if let's say I came in and ran your business for you, I ran an incredibly successful business for 15 years, agency for 15 years. So let's assume I can do it. If I came in and just ran the business for you, all you had to do was win new clients and, 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 or, or, and the work that went into that. So lead gen and so on and so forth. But if the only thing you had to do was bring me signed agreements and I took care of everything else, how quickly could you grow your revenue? Right. right? And most people go, I could double in six months. And you go, mm. okay, cool. So you don't have a revenue problem, right? Like we can establish that really quickly. Mm. You have a time problem. You, do, you don't have the time to focus on the things that are important. And it's because you've sold it for cheap. It's because you've, and this is not you, specifically because your team's amazing. But <laughs> what we do is, so the decision framework frameworks go like this. We go, I'm not sure, I can't afford a brilliant person, mm. high salary. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with a junior, right? But each employee costs the same. I have this absolute belief: every employee oh, wow. costs the same at all levels. It's how you pay them changes. So you could hire a junior and you can pay them twenty percent money and eighty percent time, right? Or you can mm. hire a senior and pay them eighty percent money and twenty percent time. And you're going to make that decision based on which of money or time you feel like you have an abundance of. And right. when you're in survival mode, you don't have money. And so you, the only thing you have is time, but you eventually run out of time as well. So you now go, I don't have, I don't have the time to cover this person. I don't have the time to, to pay 80 or put 80 hours behind this person 
to make mm. sure that they do their job. And that's when bad work starts happening. And when bad work starts happening, then you have to do it three times. And when you're doing it three times, now everyone's working nights and weekends, your client's still not happy. And now they start questioning your already discounted rate. Okay. And mm. so we get, and that's that spiral. That's where we're going. We're circling the drain here. Right. And you, oh, I like circling the drain. How lovely. You said three times. Why three? Because I would have thought it'd be them and then me. But you're saying sorry. three times that I do the work three times. Oh, sorry. I'm saying, I was saying like, if you do, if you submit average work to a client, they're going to send it back. So Good point. So that's the third. That's brilliant. You're going to have to keep, you're going to have to keep retrying to do work. Whereas if you just got it right the first time using the right people with the correct amount of time and the correct, but so as I said, it's the, the, you, the, the downward spiral in an agency can get triggered from anywhere, but it is all based in the same principle that in survival mode, you, when you start an agency, you have time, no money. So you throw time at every problem. Right. And in order to escape survival mode, you have to recognize that your time is, is critical that you could, if you stopped doing everything else and just focused on revenue, you could win enough clients to be able to get money going, but mm -hmm. you have to detach yourself from all the other uses of your time. So it's not just a drop everything. There's, it's, right. It's a lot. No, th this is absolutely beautiful because I'm right in the middle of this process. I went to see a friend of mine, David Bain, who's a podcaster too, and he sat me down at his house, he gave me a beer and said, you're an idiot. You yeah. should be rich. You should be making a lot of money. You've got an amazing concept. You're the only person in the world doing it. You've built a platform that does it automatically. You can optimize brand on search. No problem at all. As we say in France, fingers in the nose is what we say for when it's really simple. Yeah. You need to sit down and become the salesperson for two years, move all the other work to other people, and just sell for two years to build the business. And you need what he was saying in effect was make the money to be able to pay the people to do the things that you're currently doing. And in two years time, you're going to be flying. And it's, it, I think it's not quite the same as what you're saying, but it's not very far away. It's, he was saying, would, get would, out of survival mode. Imagine he's saying that we, we're talking exactly the same thing. We're right. saying in it's like slightly different ways. Um, the truth is, 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 is you go, if you're doing your books, well, are you the best person to do this? No, no. it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, so that's, that's high functioning laziness. It's like, and, and in my life, I only do the things that right. only I can do. That's it. That's my rule. If I'm the only person who can do this, that's the only thing that I do, right? Or I'm but the best thing, I say. The accounts is brilliant because it's, it's the last one, well, not the last thing. It's the last thing I've just got rid of. And I've given it to Modric and he's doing it. And he writes to me and basically says, keep your hands off. And that's brilliant yes. because he's bullying me to stop getting involved because I shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. You, what you need to do is you need to, you need to have enough insight and control to ensure that Modric's doing their job correctly. Yep. But you don't do the – so I always say like being responsible for something and it being your job are two different things. You mm. will continue to be responsible for everything in your business, mm. but it's not your job. The example I give is I'm responsible for my children's education, but teaching them is not my job. That's the school. Uh, mm. I choose the school. I make sure their teachers are good. I check their results. I make decisions around extra lessons, et cetera, et cetera. I, I am responsible for them becoming well-educated adults, but it's not my job to teach them, right? It's my responsibility. If you run an agency, if you own an agency, everything is your responsibility, but it, it, nothing should be your job. I mean, by the time I left Cerebra, I had nothing to do. I was so good at being lazy that I had nothing to do. I literally, I was like, I've run, like I hired everything that I used to do. I would go, who's the best person to do right. this, right? And you go, and then when they, sh when they show you their salary, you, you want to pass out. You're like, oh, and the number of times my business partner and I were hiring people where we thought, like we can't do this i mean this this is too much money mm. but we all so going back to this decision frameworks one of the decision frameworks is is stop paying people with time and pay people with money and that mm. means that you're hiring people for the clients that you want in the future not for where you are now 
if you hire people who can only handle what you do now, they're not a growth person. They're, they're going to hold you here. They're part of that suction. Mm. And you go, oh, I wish we could win an enterprise level client. You know, well, yeah, but you're not going to win that client with, with this level of skills or these people. Right. I, I just wanted to reiterate, I'm responsible for everything, but nothing is my job because I want to remember that one. Yeah. The other question is, does it have layers? I.e., for example, in our team, we have Elisa who runs the Caddy Cube Pro team. Does she need to have the same approach? I.e., she needs to find people to support her thinking about money and not time. Yeah. So we do things. Well, I, there's a, a phrase I use and part of my training is around doing cascading waterfalls. Mm. Um, and it's so, so it's a, the way you get a cascading waterfall. So a multi-layered waterfall is, is the same with the responsibility. And so I, if, and I'm going to make this overly simplified, but if I do a list of everything that I'm working on, like if, if someone watches me and time tracks me so that I can't manipulate it. And at the end of a month, they go, this is everything you did. And this is how much time you spent doing it. I ask two questions. The first question of each task go, how critical is this to the business? Let's score it out of one to five. Mm. And then the second question is, how critical is it that I'm the person who does this? Let's score mm. that one to five. Now, if it's critical to the business and critical that I do it, I keep it. If it's critical to the business, but not critical that I do it, I delegate. Mm -hmm. And if it's not critical to the business, I stop doing it. All right. Um, and that, that's pretty simple. Uh, now, yeah. Everything that is now very few things that are critical to the business and critical that you do it. There's very, very few things that only you can do. So there's going to be a lot up for grabs to delegate. But most delegations bounce back because the, the person you're delegating to isn't capable or isn't ready to receive that delegation. So you go to your person below you and you go, hey, listen, do a list of everything you're working on. Come back and tell me what shouldn't you be doing? What do you not want to do anymore, et cetera? And you, they have a wish list. And then they come and go, listen, this is everything that's not a good use of my time. And they do that exact same exercise. Right. And then you go to the person below them and you keep going down the, the responsibility chain. And the reality is you could probably hire a junior, a competent junior person to take 30% of a mid-levels person's work, mm. to take 30% of a senior, to take 30% of your time. And if you've done the hard work of delegating correctly, which is an art, if, but if you delegate correctly and the person below you wants the responsibility and so on and so forth, and it, you, will, you will get back, and I, I use the phrase, you've got to buy back time. So right. you will hire someone and that you buy, you're buying back 40 hours a month of your time. And you will probably lose four of those hours to oversee and manage to maintain responsibility. And so you have a net gain of 36 hours a month for that amount of money. Mm. And, then, and then you go, okay, so if that amount, if I've purchased back 36 hours a month at a hundred pounds an hour, mm -hmm. what can I sell my time for? And you go, oh, well, you can sell it for 180 pounds an hour. Well, I mean, how many hours could I, I mean, we're in the business of selling time, yeah, right? Our stock is units of time. I mean, if we come down to the very basics, you buy time off of employees for a small amount and you sell it onto clients for a higher amount, right? Mm. We, 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 we traders of time. Mm. And if you're telling me that I can, I can buy time back into my diary for half what I can sell it for, mm. I'm going to buy back every hour I can possibly get my hands on. But obviously, you've got to be have the time to do it at that high, the highest rate. But ultimately, like as I said, like I'm I'm dealing with a lot of fairly detailed topics, and and I'm being quite flippant with it. So I hope I'm not glossing. No, no, over no, it. no. It's it's absolutely fine. I, I, I'm, as as you're talking, I'm I'm not. If I, if I look a bit glazed over, it's because I'm thinking about our past experience, my current experience. And the fact that I've become aware of the value of my time, and that's thanks to people like Leanne and Christina telling me. And I've also got a team behind me who keep telling me, stop doing that. So it's other yeah. people who have got me to a situation where I'm on this route, but I'm not at the end of it yet. I want to I give you a very quick example in my personal. So I'm, uh, I said, I'm the laziest person I know, and I love it. I'm high-functioning mm -hmm. lazy. 
but I, I've got, I'm a single father. I've got two young boys and they, they, they live with me full time. Right. So, so I, I, there's a lot going on as a dad, mm. but I went through a list of going, what, what time that I, uh, that I affect as a parent is valuable to me and my children. And it's, it's not much going to the shops, not that valuable, you know, doing food shopping, doing cooking, food prep, et cetera. My kids don't value that time and I don't get any enjoyment out of it. It's a necessity. So I started researching and going, getting these, look at these companies that do all your meal prep for you. So oh. you just open the fridge and all the meals are prepped right now. There's nothing lazier to be honest. <laughs> there is nothing lazy. And, but if you're trying to eat healthy, it's also really, it's a really good strategy because it's just pre-prepped. Right. So I went, okay, how much does this cost? And I realized that I, I can't remember. It was, it was something like, like, like 500 pounds a month or something hmm. to have, to have, have all my midweek meals done. And some, I remember someone going like, Oh, look at Mr. Richie rich type of thing. <laughs> like, you know, and I sat there and I went, hang on a second. And I went and looked at the numbers and I said, I, my food bill, is let's call it 300 pounds a month if I do all my shopping, et cetera. So this is actually only 200 pounds. The cost, mm. the true cost of this over doing it myself was 200 pounds, right? How many hours of work is that? Mm. In a, that's two hours. Mm. If, I mean, you know, you could do no, no, two, 100%. Hours, two hours. So I'm going, I, I can buy back 30 hours, an hour a day of cooking, of, of shopping and cooking, I can buy back for two hours of work. So I get a net gain of 28 hours. So you know what I do? I go for walks with my kids. Right. We do puzzles. We do all that kind of stuff. And, and as I said, like we could, if we abstract this from an agency and actually just put it into what's important, which is your life. Like, like I, I spend my life, I go surfing and I go run in the mountains and I spend time with my kids and I do all this amazing things because that's where the value of the time is. And, right. and, I use the money that I make charging fair rates for what I do to buy back my time. And, 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 and it, go, it does come down. You are, you're about to go like, yeah, you, how do you charge fair rates? <laughs> no, no, that wasn't the question actually, because yeah. my last question before the last question, as it were, yeah. the second to last, the penultimate question is the kicker is how do I get the money to pay the people in the first place? Because there's a, a catch 22 if I don't have the money in the first place, how do I employ the people who are going to do that 2080 in terms of time and money that you were talking about? This is going to sound painful. Uh, the, that downward spiral that I explained, the circling the drain, it, it can start anywhere. You know, you're doing poor work. You're not making enough money. You can only afford average people. So on and so. That, the downward spiral can be kickstarted from anywhere, but the upward spiral can only start in one place and it is charging correctly, right? And it's terrifying yeah. and it's not easy, mm. but there's a lot of structural work you can do. You have to, you have to recognize that if your rates are under constant pressure, then you're not differentiated enough. Mm. You, you, you haven't established enough uh, uh, um, expertise or special specialization in what it is that you do. And because you're, if you're offering commodity services, as an mm -hmm. agency, then your prices are always going to be under pressure. Mm -hmm. But you've chosen that. Like no one else started this business for you. Like you started this, you went into that. Yep. So there, there are some, and this is interesting because it's uh, you're smiling because I'm giving you your best segue ever. But but this is a segue <laughs> into doing the things that that separate you, that help you stand out from the crowd, that that give a client the opportunity to look at you in a different league to everyone else. And if a client goes, yeah, there's all these other agencies that can do this in this band, but this team, these people, can, they're here. And when you price accordingly, that reaffirms your expertise because price determines value, not value determines price. If you know, no, I know nothing about wine. If Jason, one day you and I will, will get to meet in person and yeah. you'll invite around and I'll bring a bottle of wine because that's what you do, right? Yeah. But I'm going to a bottle store and I don't know, I don't drink alcohol at all. I don't know wines. I'm going to just buy an expensive bottle. Good point. Because an expensive bottle is a good bottle of wine, right? Mm. And an expensive agency must be a good agency, 
Okay. And if you're expensive, you're not going to win every pitch and you're going to have lots of people telling you that you're too expensive and you're just going to smile and you go, we're not, we're not too expensive, but if your budgets can't afford us yet, like when you are a big company, you can come back. Right. Like this is not my problem. (laughs) But I would still rather do less work for better rates than more Mm. work for lower rates. And so you might be less busy, but the work you do is at great rates. It's at fair, fair rates. It allows you to do brilliant work. Mm. It allows you to surround yourself with highly qualified people. And when you do brilliant work, price becomes less of an issue. A client will Mm. only complain about price until the value of the work blows their minds. And then suddenly they're like, sure. I'm so glad we went with this agency. They were they were a bit expensive. We were nervous, but they killed it. They were brilliant, right? Brilliant. And then they recommend you on. And then they say, listen, they're not the cheapest, but uh, don't, go, don't go cheap here. This is where you right. spend your money. And the upward spiral starts. Right. Now I've got some really bad news. For anybody yeah. thinking about working with CaliCube, our prices just went up 25%. So for the last question, go run in the mountains, go for a surf, do less work, higher rates. (laughs) I will. Yeah, I'll spend time sitting on my terrace playing the double bass. So the last question, as always, on branded search and beyond with Jason Barnard. How can a branded search strategy help an agency escape survival mode? I think I I think I alluded to my answer in the lead up to this question. I was amazed when I ran my agency at how many leads we got from search from and big, big companies, you know, this is the likes of Coca-Cola doing a Google search for top social media agencies in South Africa Mm. and seeing you and finding you there. And so I, I, it, it blew, it blew my mind. It is, it is such a powerful positioning from an inbound lead perspective. And if you, if, if you don't, if you aren't strong here, if you don't have a strong brand of search positioning, you're just not going to get those leads. Like people will always just pick the, the top, uh, you know, their top from their search results. Mm. And, and so from a lead inbound lead gen perspective, it's absolutely critical, but linking back to what I said just now from a pricing and a positioning perspective, yep. if you, are going to commit to doing the hard work around sticking, charging high rates, still fair, like don't be ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You charge top end rates and you commit yourself to being an agency that monetizes this, your specialization that needs to be reflected in every element of your online profile. It, 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 you, you have to warrant that at every turn. And, and for me, that's, part becomes critical right no i love the idea that if we want to charge premium rates we need to be premium rate or look premium rate be what we uh, are presenting at every stage along the journey including search and tonya eberhardt says it's not just where you show up it's how you show up so every yeah. time you show up in search you need to be sure that your brand narrative is being reflected so that the uh, the marketing manager at Coca-Cola then chooses to call you and the brand SERP right at the end when they search your name just before doing business with you is the single most important part of that. You need to look premium when your prospects search your brand name, which they will at some point. Absolutely brilliantly. Craig, that was wonderful. You allowed me to to give a little speech at the end, which was lovely. Thank you very much for your patience. (laughs) I've learned a lot and I'm sure the team at CaliCube have learned a lot. Thank you so much for sharing all that and thank you everyone for watching but before you leave we're going to oh i've got it the wrong way around we're going to look at next week it's diana shimota building a b2b demand generation engine for high growth it's going to be super super interesting we're in b2b so i'm super interested could you possibly pass the baton craig and absolutely diana um she's diana's amazing so i actually know diana she has over 20 years experience um and she very openly has committed herself to knowing absolutely everything there is to know about B2B marketing. And so you, you, you're going to struggle to find anyone who is as committed to learning and acquisition of knowledge in this space. Uh, she's going to be phenomenal on this podcast. I can't wait to listen.
Brilliant. And I love that because I actually don't know anything about it because Maria chooses the guests. And every week we're passing the baton to a guest where I think, I really want to watch that. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to it too. Amazing. This is brilliant. Absolutely amazing. Maria and Marianne, thank you so much for getting all the right guests. Thank you for getting Craig on. And you get the outro song. A quick goodbye to end the show. Thank you, Craig. Jason, thank you very much. Thank you. That was brilliant. Have fun. Oh, hang on. I've just remembered. I'm supposed to do this. Cali Cube. It's all about your brand, Serp.